When I first started this 21 ton mineral wagon saga, my intended aims was to create a rake of wagons that were the same but detailed differently. I've got 20 of these wagons now and if you want to see a review of the fleet without seeing the bonus build, skip to the timestamp that's on the screen now. I was going to do this independently but a new kit came onto the market just very recently. Something that I could have done with when I did my second video in this series and something that the hobby could have done with probably 30 years ago. And that is the British Railways Diagram 107 21 ton mineral wagon by Chivers Fine Lines. This will supersede my second video in this series in which I had to um, construct the, these wagons out of various other kits because there was nothing on the market at that time. Subsequently, Akira Scale have done their version of this as a wagon as a ready to run model, and I nearly bought them, but for whatever reason, I didn't. But that doesn't matter now because now I get the pleasure of building these, and they are available on the website for a very reasonable £10 per wagon, although you do have to provide your own wheels and transfers. Now, all the groups that I'm all of the Facebook groups and forums that I read all say the same thing about Fine Lines kits. They are probably the best on the market. The detail is crisp and there's virtually no flash. Also, these, the kit, these kits go together exceptionally well. There's no guesswork involved. I'm batch building again. I've got four of these on the go, uh, which is going to be a bit of a challenge because my initial... Uh, quest when I started this 21 min ton mineral wagon saga was to have a fleet of wagons that were essentially the same but detailed differently. I started by cutting out the sides and ends but before I put them together I scored some panel lines in their sides and ends, not all of them but some of them, to represent some replating work that had been carried out some 10 to 15 years after they entered service. As we've discussed before, coal is a really corrosive material when it contacts metal. You could use a knife for this, but I used, like to use a, a scribing tool. It sort of drags the plastic to create a sort of, uh, what do you call, um, a flame cut effect and also the re-welded line as well. As you could see in the pictures that I screenshotted from Paul Bartlett's website, there's a definite distinction between the replated panels and the original panels and that's what this will help us do when we come to paint and weathering. Gluing the floor sides and ends together to make the characteristic oblong box shape of this wagon I was using again my preferred liquid poly plastic weld from EMA. I've mentioned before that it's just a little bit harsh especially on the softer plastics that you can sometimes get in these kits but once it's stick together it's almost impossible to separate the parts. Brass bearing cups next into the hole behind the axle boxes then we can dry fit all of the underframe components to make sure everything sits square and in the correct place. There was a minor piece of adjustment to make on this one because when I put the wheel sets in the side frames splayed out just a little bit more than 90 degrees. You can just about see it there. Two minutes with the file sorted that out. Then I could glue up the side frames and do our little trick with our flat surface to make sure that the wheels all touch using the shadows of the wheels to make sure there's no gaps. Mr Chivers has kindly supplied two different types of axle box in this kit which is going to do me two favours. One, it's going to give me some spares and it's also going to give me the options of detail differences. Once cut from the sprue, they can be popped into place and glued up. Whilst looking for detail differences on some of these wagons, I did notice in a couple of the photographs on Paul Bartlett's website that some of these wagons had different axle boxes at each end. I suspect that would arise from 
many wagons going into works needing repair and the mashing two of them together to make a good one. Spares from the MDV kits from the same manufacturer enabled me to get some other detail differences in the way of some roller bearing axle boxes. Brake gear was attached next and then all of the small detail parts, the door stops, buffers and couplings and that was it for the main build. Etched brass coupling hooks are provided if you are inclined on that sort of thing. I prefer the much more chunky, unprototypical tension lock couplers, for which a mounting block is provided to hold the Backman cranked NEM pocket coupling. Personal preference for me is to add a bit of lead weight underneath. This brings up the weight of the wagon to a much more reasonable, let's see, 35, 34 grams. In one of my previous videos, I did weigh a contemporary ready to run model, and that worked out at about the same weight. That leaves us with four wagons ready for paint, a load of empty sprues, and some unused parts that will go into my spares bin. After a quick dip in some nice soapy warm water, it was time to head to the paint booth. Changing tactics on this one just a little bit, going for acrylic paints, and we'll start off with a black primer all over. As soon as that was dry, I then did the NATO black thing, which is the equivalent of Revel number no. 9, not black. Painting the panels that we described out earlier in the most orangey of the rust colours in my collection. And that would represent the fresher rust that appears on these wagons. The, the older rust is much darker. And to create that, first I'll mask off the orangey parts and then go over with all of the other browns creating a sort of mottled effect so that no one colour is more prevalent than any of the others. It's quite difficult to see under artificial light and on the camera but it is there. Next I'm going to do something possibly a little bit con controversial but totally experimental on my behalf anyway. Instead of doing sponge chipping I'm going to do sponge painting. Now my theory was that the last time I did this I uh, couldn't get enough paint to come off when I did hairspray chipping. So to control the amount of paint that goes on, that's why I'm using this method. And as you can see, it's going on the spars and on the flat surfaces, not in the corners. Which, when you look at the pictures of the real wagons, that's where the paint that survives actually sticks. It looks a bit blotchy and coarse at the moment, but we're only halfway through the weathering process, so we'll see how it turns out a bit later. Back to the NATO black, and I'll paint a panel on the bottom left hand corner ready for the numbers. Sometimes I use the numbers with a black black background, but sometimes but that can appear quite glossy and fresh and I need it to be old and haggard. It'll also be something that creates an interesting feature on some of the replated wagons that I'm doing. Opting again to paint the white line marking the end door with a little bit of masking tape and then attacking it with a stiff brush that's got a very tiny amount of thinners on it, just so we can blend in the white line to the rest of the appearance of the wagon. Numbering applied and sealed in with a coat of matte varnish. Next up was the panel wash that I created with some oil paints and thinners. Dropping it into the corners and over the raised detail that makes it all stand out just a bit more. Mopping up with a mopping up with a clean brush dipped in thinners to blend everything in so that it doesn't look too obvious. I let that dry overnight and then go back in with some weathering powders, something that can radically change the appearance of any model. As you can see in this next view, 
if I only do half of the end. The pigments were sealed in with some fixer, misted through my airbrush. The wagons were then reunited with their wheels, our couplings that were added, and I think we're done. And I also think my dodgy paint experiment might well have worked to a certain degree. I'm going to do the fleet review now. Uh, did produce a spreadsheet of all the wagons that I've built in this series. And if I can remember how to do it, I'll put it onto Google Docs and put a link in the description so you can have a little read. I was going to do this in number order, but then I decided... Now I'll do it in diagram order and then uh, originality order. So I'll start off with the diagram 110s, the w uh, riveted bodied versions. The first one has got oil axle boxes and no tops coat. The second one, roller bearings and tops coat. Next up is the welded bodied examples to diagram 107. This one has unboxed code and split oil axle boxes. Then one with a stenciled code and plate front oil axle boxes. Another oil axle box version, this time with cold 21 as the code. And then we have the one that's got the odd oil axle boxes split at one end and plate at the other. Then we've got a couple with oil then we've got a couple that have got roller bearing axle boxes, but they're both different types of roller bearing and both have unboxed codes as well. A couple of vacuum brake examples next. First one to diagram 119 with loaded empty changeover lever and the second one with self-adjusting brakes. Then we've got four of the 1975 rebuilds which utilised chassis off of very similar vehicles and had a uh, bodies made that resembled the original diagram 107 examples. The chassis, brake gear, axle boxes and buffers all differed on these examples. This last one had the chassis off of an LNER 21 ton hopper wagon. The last lot in my fleet is the 1977 rebuilds, the ones with the single door on opposite sides and no end door. This batch I struggled to get my head around until I read the book several times. Uh, they had chassis donated from various sources and they kept their original number if they didn't have uprated springs. If they had uprated springs they got a new number. The last one in the fleet is of the same 77 rebuild design but this one is of the handful that had vacuum brakes. So there we have it, a fleet of 20 wagons that are all the same but different. Something I think that would be quite difficult to do with uh, let's say more up-to-date modern wagons. Also something that would be quite difficult to do with ready-to-run models as well. I suppose it would be quite unlikely in the real world to have 20 wagons that were all different in the same train, but even more unlikely to have them all in number order. That is, of course, unless you've got the shunter named Brian, which I have. That's it for this one. In the next video, I might be waving to a friend. Thanks for watching. See you next time.